are now listening to the Serious Growth Podcast with your host, Leo Costa Jr. Hi, Charlie. Hi. How's it going, Charles? It's going good. It's been a week. Have you missed me? Does it feel like a year? It does. You liar. <laughs> I, I, I'm okay with that, though. But you didn't notice my gray glasses with my gray hair? I did. It I, looks like you're haircut. I actually did. Thanks for noticing, sweetheart. You're welcome. Hey, you know, uh, Charlie, I just want to make sure that uh, you know that I know that this show doesn't go on unless you're in this office making it happen. I don't take you for granted, Charlie. In other words, I hope the people that are watching this don't either. Because I'll seriously, I'll seriously go kick their ass. You understand? You know, one of the things I like to do is correlate like um, people that are uh, successful in an industry. And I like to correlate that with people in, under, in other industries. And we talked about this once before, I think on the last podcast maybe, um, because I think that you find that there's some similar, um, similar similarities in the process of how you get to a certain spot. You know what I mean? And, um, and I think that and I had you print out some information here today. We have what's called a serious growth uh, creed. And for me, I have developed this creed because I really think that it is the absolute foundation for absolute results and not just fly by night results, but I mean, ongoing results. And one of the things, when, as I look at that thing, when I wrote this thing up, uh, and you tell me, like, in the craft that you're in, and, I mean, I think that you're in uh, this editing and, and film business that you're in, I think that's a real craft. It's an art. And I think that the, the being in the bodybuilding industry, it's an art. It's a craft, but it's also an art. It's very creative. And, and then, of course, I think about, uh, I know you're into music. So those are kind of three different uh, areas maybe genres or something is that the right word sounds like a train's coming through and but here you know the serious growth screen i just want to read some of the the uh, in my mind some of the sort of the the principles of this creed and one is uh as being a student of the game i just want you to think about as i'm reading these off I'll, I'll, we'll talk about them but student of the game as it applies to like your craft uh discipline to the nth degree that's another one a uh, warrior mindset, never missing workouts. Repetition is the mother of skill and question everything. And just on the, on those, those are like what? One, two, three, like six principles. And how do you think any of these principles re relate to the stuff that you're doing in music and your film? Do you think it plays into that? I think every single one. Every yeah. single one. Because I... Constantly, I'm watching videos, learning more, student of the game, discipline. If if I could easily play video games or go out and hang out with friends, never do any of that. Or your mindset, you versus everyone, or don't do it. Uh, never miss workouts and repetition. If I don't do it every single day, I'm a person that, like, let's say I take two weeks off. Yeah. It's like I almost have never done it in my life. Right. And yet, because you have the reps underneath you, uh, you probably will agree that when you come back to it, it's, it comes right back. It feels like you've been gone, I mean, more than two weeks. Yeah. Yeah, I understand what you mean. But it's never like starting over. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I so, and then to question everything. Do you question everything? Um, that one I would have to think more about, you know. Be because that one right there is, for me, is a real interesting thing. Because here's when you need to start questioning everything. Not only in the beginning. If you're... Because what you're talking about right here leads to becoming a master, in my opinion. This will make you masterful as long as you stay with it at some point. Because it's got all the necessary elements there that is challenging you. These are challenging me constantly. But this questioning everything is the one that's tricky because it's pretty easy to, um, when things are going good, when you know, in my bodybuilding, when I'm starting to get like good results, uh, it's when I get to that point is when I need to start questioning 
more things because this is when I think for me, and maybe it's like this for you, if I get too in and too uh, in a place where I'm too comfortable, I start losing my edge. But it's hard for me. It's almost like I got to fight. And, and think about this: change is very difficult for people. So that's like me going in and saying, "Look, I'm getting really great results in the training routine that I'm doing," and yet. At some point, I need to make changes along the way, even if it's for no other reason than to, say, document and say, okay, that didn't work as well as I thought it did, but here's what I got from it. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, in order for me to become a master, meaning to be able to produce and reproduce a result at will, I mean, if, if people think that's easy, they're out of their fucking mind. This is where, you know, you're talking about student of the game, repetitions, and this is how all that plays into it. But, but you have to be willing to, when things are going well, to question that and say, because my state of game is how can I keep getting better? I have to keep asking myself that question. Not that where I'm at right now is good enough, because it is, but how can I get better? And I know we all have a potential that we reach, but, you know, most people never reach that because they never, it's painful to do some of these things. It's painful to be a student of the game. Why? Because you have to, it, it, it involves energy. It means you gotta stick your nose in the books. I mean, I'm always looking, you know, at information that's out there along with in the gym. That gym for me is a lab. I'm constantly trying things, never resting on my laurels, but that is way easier said than done because it takes energy, it takes discipline. So I think, it, you know, does that kind of ring a bell with you as far as, I mean, are you always looking for a better way to do stuff? Always, or, you know, new programs that I could use or just the technology. Yeah, and isn't that some of that maybe a little bit, I don't know, I don't want to be over dramatic, but kind of scary in a way, mm -hmm. you know? Because like when my sport, testing something could mean three months mm -hmm. before you can really uh, objectively say, oh, this really does work. And with technology, it gets where like... Uh, Something will be big for a couple months. Yeah, trying to learn it, and then it just completely Gone. died. Uh huh. Yeah, all that time wasted, basically. Well, it is, but, but it is, but it's almost like you almost have to do it. Uh huh. You know, and you know, like, and how I bring this back to uh, training is that at the end of the day, there you're going to have a group of things, a staple of exercises that always work. They always work. You that you have a go to every single time. I mean, I would think that even in your in in your line of work. That you have a go-to. Mm -hmm. We'll make you, templates. You know right? I mean? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You're not just out there just willy-nilly. I mean, that's okay. But at some point, you've got to document that shit. And you have to create something that works for Charlie. Like, I have to do it work, you know, do something that works for me. And in training, I can say, look, this is what works for me every single time. But just because it works for me doesn't mean that if you do that program, that it's going to work for you the same way. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just do that? But that's not the way it works. Would you agree with that? 100%. 100%. I just wanted to kind of get that off my chest before I exploded here right in front of you. Because I am full of shit. And it gets ugly. But the topic that I really wanted to talk about today a little bit, I think which ties into all this anyway, is that plateaus are a necessary evil. Do you get plateaus in your work, Charlie, where you all of a sudden it's like, I, I'm going to put it to when I was writing a couple of books that I, that I wrote. My plateau, as I related to writing, was like when I hit like a writer's block. That's that was a plateau for me, and uh, it's hard to, um, you know, it's hard to uh, handle a plateau. But plateaus in bodybuilding and in training is a necessary evil. Okay, when you hit a plateau, a writer's block, when your creativity is being blocked, whatever. Uh, how do you handle that? And then is it something that becomes a positive for you or negative? I don't know how I handle it, but it's a big negative. And they, I don't know if it's, I'm interested to hear what you think because I don't know if it's a creative thing. Because I hear people like, oh, I'm burnt out right now. Yeah. But I hear it like once a year. In the, in the creative world, because, you know, I work with other creative people, it's like all the time, like way more often on. Yeah. You know, but then yeah. that's kind of what, your next thing's always better because of that. But I don't know what gets 
other people out of it, and I don't know what gets me. Sometimes I'll just try to listen to like certain songs until I feel something or movies, but it's hard. It's the it's hard. I think what you just said is key. It's when you feel something. See, mm -hmm. and this is the thing in the sport of bodybuilding that you can't really teach because I learned this from from Platts is that you have to hear what your body is saying inside. You got to feel it. You got to feel it when when you hit that plateau, you have to feel that there's that you have to stay in the plateau. And this is sort of my uh, what I'm talking about here in the plateau being necessary. Now, a measuring stick for us because like you're saying you can't really you can't really put your finger on it other than it's a feeling. Okay? This is a combination and when you hit a plateau, it's a feeling, but it's also based on how your physiology works. Your physiology works in a certain way as it relates to training, okay? And here's what happens with most people when they're working out. Uh, they start working out, they got fire in their ass, you know, they maybe they just got onto a new routine, it's like a honeymoon. They have fire in their ass and they're going at it, but then all of a sudden, because Bodybuilding is a game of repetition, a mind-numbing repetition in, in order to get, and I don't think it's much different for guys that are trying to get stronger either, but to pack on muscle, it goes against everything that your physiology wants to do because your physiology wants to take the path of least resistance. And that's the reason why when you get a cast on your arm and when it doesn't, if there's no movement there for a couple of days, uh, then the atrophy the process starts. The body recognizes, hey, I don't need to be putting energy into this, so I'm, you're gonna atrophy, okay? That's your body, that's your physiology doing what it's supposed to do. And, um, and yet, when you're training and you hit a plateau, and once you do this long enough and you realize how physiology works, and this goes to, you know, I'm talking to people that don't know this to the nth degree serious grocers or people that are in training. Look, there are bodybuilders out there, professional bodybuilders that have people that are handling them. All the bodybuilder is doing, and I've seen these guys, is they're showing up and their trainer, in this case, their handler is telling them exactly what to do. And that's a scary place to be, in my mind, as an athlete, because you really don't know what you're doing to the nth degree to, to get to the spot that you're getting to, it's your trainer. But surprisingly, a lot of trainers don't know this information. That being said, look how much of a disadvantage I could possibly put you in as an athlete, you know? And because it's important to be able to know how to recreate something, reproduce something. So as it gets down to this, this um, uh, plateau, a lot of people will start because the newness, novelty of the training is wearing off. Um, mentally, they're starting to get a little bit bored. So the, the natural response to that is to make a change. I got a question. Yes, sir. Do you think uh, during that, it adds that like, so when you first start running or exercising, I think a big change happens like the first week or two. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it's, slows and then then you're like what the fuck you right. know what i mean yes and that's going to happen each and every time mm -hmm. even when you make that change that that same scenario will present itself again and here's what happens with most people because first you have to understand that your um mind the brain is an organ that acts like a muscle think about that it's a it's an organ that acts like a muscle. It's not a muscle. So what happens is, and of course your physiology, your your body, it's muscles, okay? Your brain is an organ. So what happens is, the brain starts getting tired of a routine first before the physiology is fully, has fully made its, um, its reach its full potential based on the routine that you have been doing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So think about this for a moment. If you are, are switching, making a change in your routine when your mind is telling you to do that and your physiology isn't fully, hasn't reached its full potential from that training regimen, what's happening? 
you're coming up short. Because the idea is to, when you get up, that's the reason why it's so important to stay in a routine. Because you want to make sure that in that particular segment, that regimen that you're doing, because usually you should do a routine for about eight weeks based on how your physiology works. Because you want to go into that. You want to enter into that plateau. This is, think of the entering in that plateau because your body starts reaching a plateau within 21 days. So in other words, when you're doing a regimen every day, from that routine, it's starting to adapt to its environment because you're doing the same thing to it. So it's adapting. Slowly but surely, it's adapting. So you enter into that plateau at day number 21. And you can stay in that plateau for another two to three weeks, depending, because it's not, it's not uh, an exact science. This is where then you have to learn how to feel what's going on. So when you get into that plateau, think of it like the sweet spot of a tennis racket. When you hit that ball in that sweet spot, I mean, that thing, that ball goes faster and it's got more power. That is where all the results, not all, most of the results are made when you're doing a training regimen. In the plateau. In the plateau. And yet, if you're not seasoned enough, if you're not a student of the game, if you don't understand this to the nth degree, we already know, based on what I just told you, that people think, oh, my brain's telling me that I need to make a whole change into my regimen. There are people that are doing this constantly. So the moral of that story is you're, you're changing your routine too often and you're killing results at the end of the day. You're not being the most efficient. So it's important to understand that this is a reason why a, a, a plateau is necessary. But think how much uh, uh, dedication and, and discipline it takes, not to mention the fact that every time you go into a weight room, you're walking in fire, you're putting yourself in pain. That's not normal. That's the path least uh, <laughs> least traveled. And that you're going, again, everything you're doing in training is going against, against what your body wants. So you're fighting that element. And then you got the old brain saying, hey, uh, fuck, fuck this shit, let's change something. Because you know that newness, what happens? Oh God, you're fired up again. And then you, you keep repeating that process. So this is, you know, these are little things that at the end of the day make a huge different difference. And then what happens is, is that people wonder why they can't make, you know, why this person can make a result and this person can't. And oftentimes what happens then is people start making excuses for some of these reasons that they, they can't, uh, you know, that they can't, uh, why they can't make that, the necessary results uh, in their training. Uh, and, and again, uh, you know, in bodybuilding, it's uh, it's crazy because it's it's like I said, it's so repetitious, and this is the kind of stuff that's always behind the scene. That you know, it's like any any business uh, uh, industry, Charlie. There's more than meets the eye. You know, you're a great fucking uh, editor. You know, I see your work all the time. But how much? You know, that just didn't happen to Charlie. I mean, if you take a look at some of the shit that you did early on compared to what you're doing now, I would imagine that you're a lot better. Yeah. All right, let's take a quick break so I can tell you about our product. Do you want a bone crushing grip? Good, because you're gonna get one with the amazing new TRS Gripper. It's a progressive grip builder with longer handles and a special ergonomic design that's like a dozen hand grippers in one. Start off easy and work your way up to quickly build your grip strength from wet noodle to pulverizing. The package includes a video from the world famous strength coach, Dr. Russ Horine, the man who worked with Leo Costa to help bring you Big Beyond Belief and the Bulgarian Power Burst. Dr. Horine shows you a simple and easy to follow workout plan that takes just minutes a day right from in front of your TV set if you want. So click on the link below and let's get started building you a stronger, firmer, bone crushing grip. So there's just some of the stuff, I mean, if you want to be great, if you want to be, you know, if you're standing the goal that you want to be this top notch, you want to compete at the very high level, you really have to understand what's going to separate you uh, from the from the ones that do. 
and from the ones that wish they could, because that's what ends up happening. I think a lot of times, you know, in a lot of, uh, you know, I know in bodybuilding, it's kind of like, you know, they you end up getting people that just, you know, they, they quit because they are that person that they wish they could, but they really don't have that. They, they don't have that serious growth creed for whatever they're doing to be able to keep handling what's, what it's going to take for you to get to the top. There's a lot of ups and downs uh, in training. I'm sure that you can, uh, there's a lot of ups and downs when you're doing your, the stuff that you're doing, you know, and in music. I mean, I just can't imagine, you know, these guys that are, that become great at, at what they're doing. Uh, what's their, what's their success? Do they have a, a, a template that they go back to again? Are these guys so, I mean, I watched a documentary on Guns N' Roses and the guy that was uh, the lead singer for The Doors, they just seemed like they were so, they just did this, like they didn't have a method. They were so brilliant that they could just go out there and just boom. Is that true or not? What am I missing when I see stuff like that? Uh, I've heard Axel, I don't know, I know The Doors, but I mean, I haven't heard much, but I know Axel said that he didn't do it, like he's known for doing drugs because yeah. he was in Guns N' Roses, but he's like, that's not true. Like I didn't do drugs yeah. and I worked out all the time. I did vocal exercises. So, you know, like, so he put his time in. Yeah, he did. You know, I, 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 the same thing when I watched them and stuff, you figured they didn't. Yeah. But there, there is a method to their, their madness, to their madness, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Because they're, they're brilliant. I mean, obviously, you know, it amazes me when I, when I watch guys like that, you know, and it amazes me when I watch guys in the gym, how, you know, when you really take a look at what they're doing, how, how easy they make the hard things look. I mean, how e yeah, how easy they make things that are really hard to do, mm -hmm. but they make it look effortless, you know? Mm -hmm. That just goes back to that repetition. Um, in weight training, you know, one of the key factors too, again, there's, there's other reasons why people make results, and this is what we're talking about today. It's not only understanding the physiology and how, again, the, how the, uh, you know, the plateau plays a really important uh, role, but there's other things too. There's things like that uh, that affects your results is, for example, using free rate versus uh, machine training, you know, and you see all kinds of people getting results in a certain way. But here's the thing, based on your physiology, it's always better uh, to, to use free weight. And if I was to use a formula, I would say that 75 percent of your uh, training should come from uh, free weight training and there's a reason for that. It's because when you're handling free weight compared to a machine, and I'm not saying, telling in, in this uh, case things that most people that are in this industry should know, but if you really want to get the most out of your training, free weight training has got to be at the center of your, uh, your training regimen because it's one of those things where you are handling, uh, you are not only lifting the weight, but you're having to balance the weight as well control that weight and what that does is that gives that extra it's, it increases the um the difficulty factor when you're having to not only uh, lift push or pull but you have to uh, balance it and control the weight that gives another element and usually the result of that is in the physique you'll see that because that's part of the reason why you see people that look very dense very hard looking when i say dense i mean hard looking so you can have somebody who is is uh, big and but they don't really look solid that's a that's an indication that they're not doing something right in their training and that could be one of the reasons why so 75 percent of it is free weight training and that includes barbell and dumbbell and if you're you're talking about uh raising the difficulty factor dumbbell uh, work would be actually harder to do than dumbbell or than barbell and yet barbell is very important because you can not do more weight when you're doing barbell versus normally versus dumbbell. I mean, so there's there's other extenuating factors that have to be, you know, that you, that again, in our sport, you have to take extra energy to make sure that you're, so to speak, crossing, <coughs> crossing all the T's and dotting the I's. Um, you were going to say something? Just, I, I was smiling because I would, when I was getting trained for couple months yeah i would beg to go on the machines and i didn't know that there was a difference but my body was telling me there was yeah the, 
you know, the free yeah. the way it's, it was, it was art. Yeah. Tough, you know? Yeah. I yeah. just felt, it, it just, I don't want to say it's easy, the machines, but I always felt that it was, it wasn't killing me like, yeah, you know. that's the reason why, because it's being, it's on a rail, mm -hmm. it's on a, you know, it's it's being guided for you. All you have to do is push and pull. You don't have to really, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. you have to balance that thing in yeah, your head. Yeah, that's why I was smiling, because I was like, I totally understand. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, and yet there's, you know, there's machines that have been made out there uh, over the years. Nautilus comes to mind. And, and, you know, I'm not saying that they're, in that case, that the, those machines are bad, but if you really want to, yeah, if you're really looking for that, uh, and again, not everybody is the same, but generally speaking, freeway training is going to uh, give you the, the better result, you know. Uh, anyway, that's, uh, you know, that's kind of what was on my mind today. And um, I don't know, do you want to, uh, anything that you want to talk about as far as, uh, you know? Yeah, I got a question. Yeah, talk to me. I, uh, I forgot my first question because once we started talking about the creed and everything, you know, relating. Uh, so over the last couple of years, I have got scared about uh, editing and not so much. I'm a little scared about editing, but through, like uh, special effects work. Mm -hmm. um, I want to be a special effects artist. I, I love editing, but I want to be a special effects artist. But in today's time... There's a lot of programs and apps coming out that basically do it for you. Yeah. So I'm like, that's scary. You know what yeah. I mean? And then I'm like, I don't think it would... Editing is such a personal touch. I really don't... I don't think there could be an app for that. Maybe they would cut out Dead Space, like if we stopped talking. Yeah. It would cut that out. Right. But that's not really editing. You get what I mean? Yeah. But, so my question is, as time goes on and on, it gets more and more scary in your career was there ever a time is there anything you can relate to that you know what I mean like something that you're like oh this is going to change the industry the game but in a negative way yeah that's a good question um, I don't know I, I just think that the there's so many you know apps apps are I mean that's all brand new uh -huh. you know when I first started there was no no social media it's brand new for even my generation you yeah. know what I mean yeah like, yeah, I just think that the hardest thing to in my sport, the hardest thing was the the change. The having because there's always people coming out and saying, okay, this is the way that you should do this exercise, mm -hmm. and it could be a, mach a new machine on the market or another way uh, to train, be it more reps, more weight, taking longer rest periods. These are all factors, and as it relates to um, when you're competing, the commitment that you have to make. Uh, to that is that you know it takes three to four months to get ready for a show and you have to be fully committed to that uh, to that process I mean that's as close as I can get because there's no app out there as far as I'm concerned I guess bodybuilding wise you're like it's all the same but what about as a trainer is that scary as in when you first started training it there they had to come to you yeah. Now I see with social media and definitely the pandemic, there's yeah. been a lot of like Zoom call me for 30 minutes. Yeah. You know, and they don't even have to leave like their house. Right. But the thing with that is what you don't, it's kind of like writing a, a, a training course for people because mm -hmm. we've written four or five or six of whatever, you know, mm -hmm. bodybuilding uh, training courses. Is that when you do something like that, and I'm going to uh, use the, the training manual as the, as the same kind of example as the, the, people that have this app, okay? Um, when you write a training course, when you write an app, you're writing it for the masses and not for the individual. And I think that's kind of what you're saying. There's that nuances, there's nuance, and that's why I've always said, you can only, in my opinion, you're gonna get the best result when you're in front of that trainer. You'll get the, you, you cannot possibly, if that trainer's worth their salt, they're gonna be way better than the app. You know, because they're what well, these some of these people, if they if they're dialed in, they're writing that their courses with physiology in mind. Like I just told you, one of the things that's happening in the industry now is um, CrossFit training is the big biggest violator of them all, constantly changing. And not like they serve their purpose, uh, but physiologically, they're in, in that industry. More people get hurt in cross training, CrossFit training, than any other training program. It's very dangerous, but when you're in, uh, when you're writing that 
uh, app and that uh, manual, hopefully you know enough about this information where you're saying, okay, you should be on a certain training regimen with a certain amount of reps and, and rest periods for X amount of time. Hopefully, like what we've done is say, look, it takes about this X amount of time to, you know, for your body to hit a plateau. We know it's important to stay in the plateau. And that's why we say you should generally come out of that plateau in eight weeks and start making changes generally. But there's those athletes that hit a plateau and that, again, it's not an exact science. It's based on physiology, but not everybody's physiology is the same. You have different lever systems and you just, the way that you uh, exhaust, your, the way that your muscles exhaust, not everybody's the same. How can you do that in an app? How can you get that kind of feedback to know, because you have to know that yourself, or you have to have a trainer who's tied into you, right in, right there with you, to because when I'm training people, I'm constantly watching, I'm watching how they're fatiguing. I'm watching how they are emotionally. How can you do that in the app? So it sounds like, and this is crazy, because this doesn't sound like Leo, you have more faith in people. As in, because I'm like, I'm like, dude, I'm scared. And you're like, no, I'm not, because it, it, it's, that's really a personal thing. But so is editing. But here's my thing. Maybe I shouldn't say it, but this is Serious Grill Podcast. So I'll say, I feel like people are dumb. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. they're like, you're like, because both of ours go to the same thing. It's a like, as in mine is, yeah, they could cut the dead spaces. Yeah, and working out app could tell you what to do. But it's the personal that's right. touch. Yes. But I feel people are too dumb to get that and be like, fuck it, I'll just pay $5. Well, the thing about that is, is you're, I think you're right about that. <laughs> but this is where the, the person that's the trainer, if they're really good, they're ahead of that. You know, they're watching things like, okay, today, you know, we can't, I can't just give you a, because this is what drove me nuts with, with personal trainers. They worked off a, a, a sheet uh, that basically was like, okay, this is what we're going to do today, three sets of 10. Whether you felt great or not, you did three sets of 10. Now, that could mean that you had, an, had uh, that he, he could have done or she could have done the trainer, could have pushed you further to get more result from that one set. And yet you're just simply following the number. You're following that app. I'm watching to see how you're fatiguing. If you're not fatiguing at rep number 10, I have you do 15 reps. You can't teach, you can't put that in the app. So an app is a second, it's, it, it, there's a purpose and it serves a, a purpose. That's what, that's what I was gonna say next. Both of the, what's hard though to sell it is that both of these apps that we're talking about, your side and my side, they'll both do something. Mm -hmm. So it's up to the person to be like, a little extra money for the person though is gonna go longer and better. Yes, but you have to understand, Charlie, most people are okay with average results. <clears throat> They're not, if, when the stated goal is to be like the best, that's a, that's a small group of people that are actually willing to, to do that. That's what's scary. Most people are just okay with, hey, this is good enough. Uh -huh. I have it on my, I have a decal on, on my, uh, at my gym. It says good enough isn't. Think about that statement. And I think that's kind of what we're talking about, you know? And and look, it works for that group of people. And this is where I, I've, I've talked about this before. I'm constantly frustrated at my own uh, facility. My mindset is when I get into the gym is to get the most out of every single rep and every single set that I'm doing. I state my goal. My goal now is to redefine what 66 looks like. I want to get big. And I want to be able to do that in a way that I don't have to do the things that I had to do when I was competing because I'm enthusiastic enough to keep finding like new ways to get results. But most people aren't like that. But that, the app's good enough, you know? But is it? You know, is it? Because I wonder, it'd be interesting to do a, a uh, uh, sort of a survey on how many people that start the fucking app and how, many, how long they last with that app. That's what I'd like to find out, because I can tell you this, people that go to those gyms that are $35 a month, hey, it's only $35 a month. You look at the retention rate of those people, 27 and a half days, fuckers are gone. But they're still, they're still signed up. Oh, they're still you signed know? up. Yeah. They like the idea of uh -huh. it, 
but you know that's just not based. I again, I don't know if that's really similar to what we're oh, yeah, we're we're, we're talking about. But it's just kind of funny how things do. You know, how many people actually rise to the top as a uh, what kind of editor? Do you have special effects editor? That's what I want to be. Okay, but how many people actually rise to the? It's not you know it's in every industry. How many people actually do that? You know, I was just watching a a, a uh, uh, and I think it's, it has to do with. And it goes back to that serious growth creed. It has to do with the mindset and 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 when you state a certain goal. Jose Canseco was a premier. Uh, he's before your time. He's like during my time. He was a premier uh, home run hitter. The guy was amazing. But he was just very average coming out of high school. He was very average just in uh, when he was a minor league player. When it all changed for him is when his mom was on her, her deathbed. And he knew that she'd never see him become the athlete that he wanted to be. When he stated that he wanted to be the greatest baseball player in the world, the guy went on to achieve amazing things. But up until that point, he was very average. So what's the difference in that? He's, in my mind, I keep going back to this. You have to fucking state a goal. No matter what you're doing. If you're editing, state the fucking goal. And the goal that you state for yourself, you might feel uncomfortable with that. Because can you imagine saying, I want to be the greatest fucking uh, special editor or special effects editor in the world? You're going to think, no, I don't, I don't really think I can. See, that's where you have to believe that you really can. And that's what the great ones do. Because look at, in this guy's case, he was very average. He was floating around, just, he was a very average just good enough. Uh -huh. Something about his mom not, not being able to see him play, and he just wanted to do that for her. That was the state of goal, to do it for her and to be the greatest baseball player in the world. And I'll tell you what, he became that in many ways. I think I think there's a real real moral to the story in that. And I think it's, it, it's sort of, uh, you know, it crosses all these lines. What kind of a commitment are you really making to, you know, it's like right, right now when, you know, we got a, a, this, when you're starting a new podcast, I'm telling you, I want to be one of the greatest podcasts that are out there. But I also know I got to be willing to tolerate all this, all this stuff that's going to lead me there. Jose Canseco just didn't become a, a power hitter and a, one of the greatest ball players in the world. He just it didn't just because he said that. Then he had to he had to provide all the action and the dedication and the serious growth creed to make it happen. And there were a lot of downs. In his career, a lot of us with a lot of downs. It just I find it just fascinating because I'm always looking at the people. Why is that person so uh, so successful? I want to know how he did that. I want to know the inside of that. When I see stuff like that, when I guy, because I never knew that. I never knew that that it, it took that before he became that great hitter. I just thought the guy was just a natural, you know. And how many people in your industry are naturals? And how many people are, I mean, maybe you don't know this. I know in my industry, in athletics, the people that are, are the most gifted, they're not the ones that usually get the most out of themselves compared to that person that's not a, a gifted athlete. They got to work their fucking ass off to get to that point. They're the ones that they reach their full athletic potential. Yeah, yeah. Would you say the same thing happens yeah. in your industry? I would. It's kind of the same but different, isn't it? Yeah. It's a commitment you got to make in your fucking head. And when it comes to uh, weight training and serious growth training, and this is what a lot of people don't understand, and that's the reason why, to be honest with you, in, my, in the heyday when we sold all these ma training manuals, do you think that all those people use our training course? Hell no. In fact, I will tell you this, and I'm happy and I, I'm honored that they bought the book. Don't get me wrong. But as it relates to getting the most out of that manual, only a small percentage of those people did that. They bought it and it sat on their shelf. Why? Because they didn't state the fucking goal. They didn't have that serious growth creed. You cannot do this shit if you're not all in, whether it's in weight training or in becoming a the world's best uh, special effects editor, in my opinion. Let's take a quick pause to tell you about something you are definitely going to want. 
Do you want a bone crushing grip? Good, because you're gonna get one with the amazing new TRS Gripper. It's a progressive grip builder with longer handles and a special ergonomic design that's like a dozen hand grippers in one. Start off easy and work your way up to quickly build your grip strength from wet noodle to pulverizing. The package includes a video from the world famous strength coach, Dr. Russ Horine, the man who worked with Leo Costa to help bring you Big Beyond Belief in the Bulgarian Power Burst. Dr. Horine shows you a simple and easy to follow workout plan that takes just minutes a day right from in front of your TV set if you want. So click on the link below and let's get started building you a stronger, firmer, bone crushing grip. I got another one. Uh-huh. I'm right here, buddy. <laughs> so here, here's one that kind of makes me go into a, a burning spot, like a getting burnt, is age. Yeah. You know, and but I know our we you just released a new program about people your age right now. Yeah. But even when you got into bodybuilding, you were in your early thirties? Uh twenty seven. Okay, so you're right. So but that's old in this that, sport. Exactly. That's old. And I, I got into filming later, too. Yeah. You know, and now I'm, I'm in my early, early 30s. Yeah. Super early 30s. Yeah. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is, so how how did you not, that just didn't bug you? Because I would feel, you know, getting into filming, I always constantly told myself, you got into it too late. And I can only imagine you had to have felt the same way or no. Of course. Was, yeah. But that's exactly the reason why I wanted to prove that that wrong because yes someone who's my age now 66 i'm not supposed to be getting the results i'm getting yeah. and i'm not doing it with any uh, peds performance enhancement uh you know uh chemicals at all you know it's all natural but it's like yeah and that's part of the reason why i got in the, in the bodybuilding to begin with because it was so damn hard to do that shit is very challenging and it turns me on it makes me want to say i can do that that's the challenge for me and so listen age is obviously a factor you know, I'd be lying to you if I said I could get the exact kind of shape that I did when I was in my 40s. What was out in your time? Magazines? Yeah. So when so when you first, 27, you started working out. Yeah. I'm sure you were super into it. So you're getting every magazine you yep. could. Were you looking at, were you seeing people like 21, 18? Oh, right? yeah. Oh, yeah. What, uh, have you ever heard of the Flash TV show? Maybe. Uh, so I, I was really into it, season one. And I was like, man. So I was like looking up, I'm like you, I learned everyone that I'm into, you know, and all their ages were like, yeah, I like was just a couple years, not dramatic, but I mean like three, four, two years younger than yeah. me. And I was like, oh, it's, it's but, but, late. but Charlie, here's the thing, you know, easy. and this is, this happens to, to most people. Most people get in the way of themselves. Oh, they're, they're younger and I'm done. You know, I can't do that because they're younger. They get in their own way, you know? Um, and you know, and I, I think another thing that's important is that you're not competing against them. You're competing against yourself. And unless you're not of sound mind, I don't understand why that would even be a factor. I mean, I can understand, you know, where you have to use your body. My body will not respond exactly like it did when I was 21, but I will say this, I'm in better shape than I was when I was 21. But I mean, in my bodybuilding days as a 40 year old, a 35, 40 year old competitor, I don't know that my body can get back to that point, but I'm not discounting it. When I go to the gym, you know what? I'm thinking that I can because I want to see if I can. If That's the challenge. The challenge is part of what attracts me to this stuff. But in your, I mean, I don't know how physically fit you have to be. If you've got all your, your wits about you, why the fuck would somebody that's 18 have an advantage over somebody who's more seasoned? I think possibly. I never look at it here. This might be a problem. I never look at it as just special effects because I do so, like, I just think too old in life as in because I'm a musician. So I'm all constantly always thinking about maybe I could do something with music or editing or acting because yeah. I always get thrown yeah. in as an actor. Yeah. So it's just like, as in, I just think I'm too old for like the entertainment business, I guess. Let me I ask guess you, that would be the best. Let me thing. ask you this. Do you know anybody in your business that's older, that's made it? Of course. Okay, so if somebody, uh, if, if one person can, why can't you? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's true. Uh-huh, it's true. 
I mean, what, what ends up, look, some people are just smarter and they just have a knack and they just have a gift, okay? But there are people that are doing it. If one person can do it, that means you potentially have the ability to do that. It's, I think, what do you think is really holding you back? Do you really think it's it's your brain not being able to be that creative? Do you really think that? I don't know. I think it's just my mind trying to go against me, you know? Like, you're getting in your own way. Uh-huh. <laughs> Just throwing out you get You're getting in your own way. And you know what, Charlie? Some people are afraid to do it because they are afraid to fail. Because if you make that commitment, you let... It's more important that you make the commitment to yourself. But I think so many people... I'm I'm that person, too. I feel that, too. You know? If I, t- if I told you no, I think we're all like that. We all have doubt. I watch these tennis players. Uh, Ralph and Nadal. This guy's won so many tournaments. I mean, he's like at the top of the top. And he still has doubt. All he does that's different than you and I is that he takes that doubt and he makes it work for him. Your doubt is working against you. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it's kind of what it's coming down to. Uh-huh. But I think it's pretty normal. It's just normal emotion. And we're, you know, sometimes we're afraid to even try because we're going to fail. It's going to hurt. And you don't want to feel that pain. Yeah. But I think maybe you're, and I'm, I'm not talking to you specifically, myself included, it's like, well, maybe I'm just not real willing to, to make that commitment because of that. And that's why I'm not going to make it. Go fully. Go I'll, fully. I'll All in. All in. Enough. Yeah, just enough. <laughs> enough to, to you know to make you think. Oh, well, I really don't want to put that much in because uh-huh. of these reasons. So it's good enough. Yeah, good enough. Anyway, uh, okay. Well, I think it's been a good show for me at least. You know, hopefully it's been uh, informative. I mean, again, I just like bringing you in on this to hear from like an outsider, so to speak. And like I said, I think there's so many things that just correlate. Uh, but it's fun to hear other people and how they're thinking, you know. Anyway, uh, I guess until next time, huh, Charlie? Yeah. A week from now. Toodles. Thanks for listening to the Serious Growth Podcast. For more episodes like the one you just listened to, subscribe to us on your mobile podcast app and leave us a review. If you'd like to reach out, you can find us online at SeriousGrowth.com. Until next time, train smart and train hard.